Um, hi, good evening. Thank you for the introduction, Rose. I appreciate that. Um, as she said, my name is Nila Shvora. Um, and to keep the sort of baseball euphemism going, I am happy to be adding lead off today um, as we talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart. I'll tell you our order of events today. So you'll hear from me, and I'll go through the agenda here in a second. And then I'll hand the baton off to Dr. Liu. Um, Jennifer Liu is a, is a, a really great urologist um, in our area and kind enough to, to be here to talk about screening um, with prostate cancer references. And then Dr. Liu will hand the, the microphone off to Dr. Fadi Youssef. Um, and Dr. Youssef is a pulmonologist uh, at Long Beach Memorial. And then our cleanup hitter is Karen Lappin, who's sitting there in the back, and she'll talk a little bit about genetics. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a great lineup that we have here. And again, I want to thank everybody for being here and, and being present. Um, so I assume this will work. I'm going to move forward through this. OK, very good. Um, so I'm an oncologist, right? And as a medical oncologist, I've come to appreciate the importance of screening for cancer. Um, what, what cancer screening has done has, has allowed us to find cancers at earlier stages, at more treatable stages. And that's extremely important, as we've come to find out. So the agenda on, on what I want to talk about today with you guys is the why on cancer screening. Why do we have it? What's the data show about cancer screening? Um, I will spend a couple slides talking about COVID and the pandemic and the impact it had on cancer screening. And then I'll dive directly into breast cancer screening and colon cancer screening before handing uh, the microphone off. Um, so this is sort of a cancer screening 101, right? The question of why we do screening and, and what the data shows. And so I, I can confidently say that our existing cancer screening technologies have, have offered really significant value. There is data that shows that the risk of death from cancer has decreased by 32% over a 30 year span because of screening tests. And it's an interesting thought, right? What, what, can, what did we do before 1991, for example, or, or before we had screening tests? And, and you know, I, I often have questions from people in the community that say, if I don't feel well, why do I have to have a screening test? And it's data like this that tells me the why on this, right? So we can save people's lives by doing tests that are so important. Um, the data, again, says that you know, because we've decreased the rate of, de of, of death from cancer by 32%, that we actually have increased the, the lives of, of Americans, that 12 million more years of life um, are present because of these screening tests. That's a lot of years. That's a lot of life. That's a, that's a big impact. Um, there's a, f a fiscal impact, right? This data set also said that we, we've saved at least $6.5 trillion. And how does that work? Well. When you think of finding a cancer before it becomes metastatic, before it requires expensive treatments, you're saving a lot of money by diagnosing them at either precancerous stages or at early stages. And so I think that's really important to keep in mind as we walk through this. This is a really busy slide, and it's not meant for, for, for me to go through all the details on it. But the important part of this is that this is the, this is the United States uh, Preventative Task Force, and what this um, this entity, this service does, is it goes through and it adjusts the protocols for screening tests. And so here you can see four different cancer types, right? So breast cancer, colon cancer, cervical cancer, and lung cancer. And this is your timeline, right? All the way up into 2021. And the point of this slide is that screening tests or the recommendations for screening are constantly changing. And they're changing based on epidemiologic studies, on what we're seeing um, with reference to cancer. So I, I think that's a, a good example of how this is a dynamic idea, that we're changing our screening tests as we go forward. Um, and, and I wonder if Dr. Youssef, who's going to be talking about pulmonary uh, lung cancer screening, is up to date with the fact that today there was a change in lung cancer screening. We'll see. I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know what you're about to say. But, but that's the point. I got a notification just today that we, we've changed lung cancer screening. So that's the point of, of what I was trying to make. And so, you know, if cancer screening is important, as I've showed, then I, I, then I think I can say the opposite, that not screening is detrimental. And that's what this slide is meant to show. So it's a very busy slide, but let me walk you through this. It's titled The Impact of the COVID Pandemic on Screening. And as, as you look through these, these 
these bar graphs, it's important to note that the, the blue bars are pathology reports or diagnoses of cancer across 2019. And the white and blue are the pathology reports diagnosing cancer in 2020. The big orange bar is the shutdown that we went through in March of 2020 because of, of, of COVID, the pandemic. And then the shaded area, sorry, the shaded area here represents mortality rates from, from COVID. And I think the most important line on this, on this graph is this red line, right? So if percent change is 0% here, what they're showing you is that there is far less cancer being diagnosed during 2020 and the shutdown policies than there was in 2019. And so what does that mean as we think about that? That doesn't mean that people didn't have cancer. It means that we weren't screening. And if we weren't screening, it means we weren't diagnosing. And of course, if those cancers are not being diagnosed and we're waiting till the next year to find them, they're probably at a later stage. And that's gonna have impact, right? And if you look at numbers on this, in this particular study, they, they found that in these two states in the United States, there were 30,000 fewer reports in 2020 than in 2019. And that's scary, right? And that's going to have impact. And there will be more data collection, and, and we'll find out that probably there's a spike in later stage cancers diagnosed in 2021 than we'd normally see. Um, that data is all coming. And I, I'll speak anecdotally. I'll tell you that I, there are many times that a patient's come in in the last year, the last 12 months, and said, you know, I didn't have my mammogram or my CT scan done for screening because of COVID. And, and now I have cancer at a later stage. So I've seen that on my own. So I think the most important thing is to get back on schedule, right? And that's why this meeting was so important for us, to educate all of you to go back to your primary care provider and say, hey, um, what, what screening tests am I due for? What am I behind on? What, how do I get caught up? And so it's the education part that I think becomes really, really important now as we move away from the pandemic and the effects that it had. So let me dive directly into breast cancer screening now. Um, so some facts on breast cancer. Uh, this isn't new information, right? Breast cancer is very prevalent. Breast cancer accounts for 12.5% of all new cancer cases annually in the United States. I'm sorry. In, uh, across the world. It's the most common cancer in the world. In the United States, about 30% of all newly diagnosed cancers in women each year are breast cancer, and it's the leading cause of death related to cancer in women. Um, and this is a sobering fact. About one in eight women will develop invasive breast cancer sometime during their lifetime. That's really, really common. Not, not news to anyone here, I would assume. Um, a woman's risk for, for breast cancer nearly doubles if a first-degree family member has been diagnosed with breast cancer. First degree meaning a mom or a sister or a daughter. Um, and, and we know now that 5 to 10% of breast cancers are linked to a known gene mutation. The most common mutation that we've all heard of is the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 mutation. So that predisposes you, and the numbers look like a 70% risk, more or less, of breast cancer in your lifetime if you carry that mutated gene. Um, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death for, in the United States for black and Hispanic women. And we see a lot more breast cancers in the Ashkenazi Jew population because of the higher rate of BRCA mutations. What are risk factors in prevention? So things that we cannot control and things that we can control. Well, you can't control getting older, unfortunately, but that's a risk factor. Right? There are genetic mutations that I mentioned that, that we inherit, we cannot control. Um, reproductive history. So this is based on really the, the exposure to estrogen during our lifetime. So in women who start their menstrual period before the age of 12 or who start menopause after the age of 55, all of that estrogen exposure leads to a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, a personal history of cancer puts patients at, at a slightly higher risk for breast cancer. A family history, of course, of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, previous treatments, including radiation therapy, can lead to breast cancer. Um, and exposure to the drug DES, which was a synthetic estrogen that were given to, to pregnant people during the pregnant women during the 40s and 50s. So that exposure can also be um, a risk factor. But then most importantly to me on this slide is the risk factors you can change. 
So not being physically active is linked to breast cancer. Being overweight or having obesity after menopause. Taking hormones for a long period of time um, has been linked to breast cancer. A reproductive history, so having your first pregnancy at the age of, after the age of 30, not breastfeeding, and, not, and never having a full-term pregnancy can be related to breast cancer risk. And then drinking alcohol as well. So I think these are important things to think about, right? I, of course, there are risk factors we can't change, but there are things that we can do. And then this moves forward into the idea of, 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 of cancer, breast cancer screening, right? So what do the statistics say? So there have been a few studies, um, and, and I really liked this Swedish study that was done. Um, the, in the Swedish study that was first published in 1982, uh, they showed a 31% decrease in mortality from breast cancer by using mammograms. And what I liked about this is that they presented the update 29 years um, later, or in, 19, in 2011, uh, 20 years later, they showed that, that that mortality decrease was 63%. So as more women signed up for their mammograms um, on this study, they found that there was a great impact in, in decreasing mortality from breast cancer. In 2021, a data set showed that 64% of women in the United States, 45 and older, had had a screening mammogram in the past year. And in that same data set, 76% of women between the ages of 50 and 74 had had a mammogram in the past two years. So I think we're doing a great job of making sure most people have a mammogram done. I think that's very common, and I think it's really good practice. And I think I've shown that that can absolutely decrease the chance of dying from breast cancer. So what are the guidelines? The guidelines say to receive your baseline mammogram between the ages of 35 and 40, and that we should have yearly screening mammograms from 40 onwards. I never put an upper limit on, on screening tests because you can't really tell me that an 80-year-old woman who's in perfect health won't live long enough to get breast cancer. And I think that becomes a conversation between the patient and their primary care provider. We, we advocate for regular self-breast exams, and we're not just looking for lumps or masses, right? Things like breast thickening, changes in size and shape of the breast, women with um, dimpling or redness or pitting of the breast, changing in the nipple or areolar appearance and, or spontaneous nipple discharges are things to look for. And so if, if a woman has any of these things or notices any of these, it's important to talk to your primary care provider. And then I advocate always for a yearly clinical breast exam by a physician. I think that's really important. And it's something that we obviously moved away from as we started doing telehealth visits and Zoom visits with our primary care providers. So again, another plug to get back in and get through what sort of common trends we, we set up during pandemic times. And then this is important, and I thought this was a, a good way for me to anecdotally speak about our center. So I, I, uh, I routinely present data regarding cancer statistics at, at the Todd Cancer Institute and Memorial Care Long Beach and what we're seeing. And the, the red bars are our facility, the blue bars are across the country, all the ca cancer committees um, and centers across the country. And so what you're seeing here is the stage of diagnosis of breast cancer. And I think what's really, really valuable to think about and to look at when you see this is how many breast cancers are being diagnosed at stage zero, stage one, and stage two. Right? Nearly 90% of patients um, are, are diagnosed with breast cancer at an early treatable stage. Why? Because mammograms work, right? Because we can find, we can use mammograms to find these, these tumors at, at curable stages. Only about 4% of patients at our center and across the nation were diagnosed with metastatic disease at presentation. That's, that's huge. That, I'm really proud of, of curves like this. And then this is the idea, uh, this is the age, um, the age graph. So at what age are patients with breast cancer being diagnosed? And as you can see, there's kind of a, just a bell-shaped curve with most patients being diagnosed at the ages of 50 to 70, but there are still younger patients being diagnosed with breast cancer at the ages of 40 to 49 and, and even in their 30s. So that's, that's what our numbers look like at our center. So move, moving forward, switching gears, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, colon cancer screening. Um, as we know, the GI tract goes from the esophagus all the way to the anus, and, I, and I'm concentrating today on colorectal cancer and screening for colon cancer. 
Um, facts. So colon cancer is the third most common cancer for men and women in the United States. And the good news is that the, the data shows that the death rate is decreasing in both men and women from colon cancer. Why is it decreasing? Well, for a few reasons. Number one, screening, right? So polyps are found more often by screening and removing before they can become cancerous. The colon cancer that's found earlier is easier to treat and cure, and that's being seen more frequently. And then treatments have improved. So the treatment of metastatic colon cancer has gotten infinitely better in the last 20 to 30 years, and that's another reason why not as many people are dying as they used to from colon cancer. Again, risk factors and prevention. So things we cannot change, we mentioned the, a few of these before when we talked about breast cancer, getting older. But having a history of colorectal polyps or a history of colon cancer is a risk factor. Having a personal history of inflammatory bowel disease, um, a family history of colon cancer or polyps. Uh, there are two inherited syndromes that, we've, that we notice, I'm sure Karen will go into this, but Lynch syndrome and, and FAP or familial adenomatous polyposis are inherited syndromes that can lead to colon cancer. Uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds are most, in, in some cases, more associated with colon cancer and having type 2 diabetes. But again, the most important part is what we can change. So we can become active. We can avoid being overweight and, and obese. We can change our diet. So it's been shown that a diet high in red meat processed foods can raise a risk for colon cancer. Drinking alcohol, smoking, and having low levels of vitamin D are also risk factors that are associated. Um, these are screening guidelines. So again, like I mentioned before, the, the US uh, Preventive Task Force changed the screening age from 50 to 45, much because we saw an increasing incidence amongst patients who are younger. So the age is now 45 to start screening. Um, it's advocated to, to continue screening through the age of 75. But again, I caution that if I've got a very healthy 80 year old I don't think it's wrong to recommend a colonoscopy or a screening test. And what are your screening options? So there is, there is an approved screening option that is based on just checking monitoring stool and sending in a, a card looking for blood or looking for tumor DNA. Um, and then of course, as you all know, there are visual exams like colonoscopies and sigmoidoscopies. I personally advocate patients to have a visual exam such as a colonoscopy because there is a false negative rate with some of these stool-based tests and because if there is a stool-based test that is positive, it has to lead to the visual exam anyways. So I, I usually talk to patients about getting and staying on, on up to date with colonoscopies. Um, but the most important take home message is I just need, I need everybody to get screened no matter which way they, they choose. I mean, I think that's the most important part. And then of course, be aware. So m many times colon cancer can be caught before it has symptoms, but then many times there are symptoms that patients should pay attention, attention to. So changes in bowel habits, urgency is on having um, a bowel movement, for example. Um, by change in bowel habits, I meant shapes and, and sizes of, of, of stool. Uh, rectal bleeding or blood in the stool, abdominal cramping and unintended weight losses are all things to look for that can be related to a colon cancer. And so again, what, did, what are we seeing at Memorial Care Long Beach Medical Center with regards to colon cancer data? So this is very interesting. Right, so remember the graph on breast cancer, and again, our facility is in red. But what you see in our facility and across the nation is that 22% of patients are diagnosed at, met at the metastatic stage, right, at stage four, and a theoretically non-curable stage. And that's, that's tough for me to look at, right, because in my opinion, all of those patients, the majority of those patients had a colon cancer at an early stage that just didn't get detected and probably because they weren't, that patient wasn't up to date on their, on their screening tests. So that, I want that number to look like our breast cancer data, right? That's what, that's what I'm, I'm shooting for. And I'm hoping that, again, with more education, we can get that number down. And then when you look at age, right, what I notice on here is that, yes, we do have pa patients between the ages of 40 and 49 being diagnosed with colon cancer. And I'm thankful that the screening committee decided to bring the age of screening down from 50 to 45. But again, you see a lot of patients between the ages of 50 and 70 being diagnosed with colon cancer. So screening guidelines for colon cancer. Um, wait, sorry, that went backwards, didn't it? Okay, so take home messages. Um, 
Cancer screening has been shown to reduce mortality by discovering cancers at earlier stages, many times before symptoms develop. It is near and dear to my heart to advocate for cancer screening tests. Number two, breast cancer screening, I think, has been very successful in implementation among patients. And I noted that 76% of women in one study had had a mammogram within the past two years. Colon cancer screening has recently been changed to 45 years and older, and I think for good reason. And in our own center, breast cancer and colon cancer are mostly diagnosed at earlier stages thanks to these screening tools. But of course, that number, that stage four number, is something that we aim to improve over uh, as we educate more of our, our patients. And I think that's it. I leave you with a picture of us from last night. I hope, <laughs> I hope everybody had a very safe and healthy Halloween. Um, so I will move forward, and again, I will introduce Dr. Liu, who's one of my favorite urologists around, um, and she will talk about prostate cancer. Thank you. Okay, so they sent a lady in to do the hard one. <laughs> of all the cancer screenings, you're going to learn and read about prostate cancer actually is one of the most controversial screening that we recommend, and I'm going to get into it a little bit. Uh, so let's just start. What is the prostate? People ask me all the time, what's the point? What is this prostate for? And it's a male reproductive organ that's been between the penis and the rectum of men, and it's along the channel pathway for urination. So when the bladder fills with urine, it pushes the urine through the urethra, through the penis, and I always like to say that the prostate goes around the urethra like a donut. And as men get older, because of normal genetic and hormonal changes, that donut grows and becomes a vice. So when you hear people, when they get older, talking about their prostate, not their prostrate, um, it's, because, it's a natural part of aging. And so when that happens, that's when you hear about people getting up three, four times at night in the bathroom and just generally becoming ornery old men. And as men get older, it's, you know, there are even small prostates can cause a lot of problems. You know, I have men with small prostates that have terrible urination issues. I have men with big prostates that swear they have nothing wrong. And it really, it provides a key protein when you're trying to reproduce. So it's a, not an essential organ for living, but it is an essential organ for reproduction. So when you hear someone complaining and complaining about it, that's why they often say, all right, enough, just get, get relieve me of this. I'm not having kids anymore. I don't need it. It is the most common cancer in men, second to skin cancers. It, one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And this is where the controversy gets a little crazy, but I'll tell you about that afterwards. So one in eight men that you know will have prostate cancer at some point in their lifetimes. The average age of diagnosis is 66. And the more likely uh, men to get it are both African-American and older. I'm sure a lot of you have heard before, well, if you live long enough, you're going to get prostate cancer. And that is true. And that's part of why it's controversial. One, in 41, one out of 41 men with prostate cancer will die of prostate cancer. And that's a really important number to understand. Only one out of every 41 people who get diagnosed with it are going to die. So you're like, okay, wait a minute. So if I'm diagnosed, 40 people are going to live, meaning they're going to die from a heart attack, a stroke, something unrelated to their prostate cancer. So it's important to know when we talk about prostate cancer, we're talking about 10-year life expectancies, 20-year life expectancies, and what are your chances of dying from prostate cancer or a car accident on the 405? Okay, so there's, it's a, it gets a little murky, but I'll try to hopefully explain it. Um, so most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer do not die from prostate cancer. So that's a really important thing to know. So, you know, when you think about it, it's sort of like there are a lot of people out there who say, well, then don't diagnose it. You know, if men are going to get diagnosed with prostate cancer and they're not going to die from it, then why should we know? You know, whenever the C word is brought in, it's really scary. 288,000 men a year are diagnosed with prostate cancer. So that seems kind of important to know, but only 34,000 men a year die from prostate cancer, okay? And that's where some of this controversy comes in. Um, yeah, 35,000. Okay, so now Dr. Vora was talking about how wonderful the United States Preventative Task Force is, 
And it is, you know, of course, I'm a big believer, breast cancer screening, colon cancer screening, those are, they have been saving lives. It gets a little tricky when it comes to prostate cancer, and it gets tricky for several reasons. Number one, we live in 2023. We're always making changes to how we treat things, our paradigms. And so a lot of the information and a lot of the clinical studies that were used for the uh, United States Task Force for prostate cancer screening was really based on old data and old treatment algorithms. Okay, so that's a really important thing to understand because, you know, science is always evolving. And, and there was a big evolution in prostate cancer in the 2000s. So to give you an idea, early 2000s, if you had prostate cancer, we said, okay, you have to have surgery or you have to have radiation. It must come out. But then we really evolved, again, because of science and clinical trials, and we realized, wait a minute, there are different kinds of prostate cancer. There's the kind that you're going to live with and not have a problem with, and then you're going to have the kind that you can die from. So the way I like to describe it to my patients, we all know that fire is dangerous, right? A fire in a fireplace is dangerous, but it's controlled. It's in the fireplace. But if you let that fire get out and become a wildfire, then it's a problem. And what happened in the 2000s was we actually stopped offering, not stopped, but we started offering a new treatment for prostate cancer, which we call active surveillance, okay? Meaning, yes, you have prostate cancer, but you meet these criteria, and so the likelihood you're gonna die from prostate cancer is really low. So people say to me, so wait, we're not doing anything? And I'm like, no, we are. We're just surveying it. We're just observing. We're gonna keep an eye on you rather than treat you. And you know, people say, well, that sounds crazy. But the reason why is because the treatment of prostate cancer is very complicated when it comes to a quality of life aspect. So that goes beyond the screening reasons, but basically the treatment of prostate cancer can cause erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. So what man's gonna sign up for that, right? And so we were over-treating men who had low-grade prostate cancer. So in the same way, when you have you know, skin cancer, squamous cell, basal cell, no big deal, you just have to make sure it's not melanoma, that's similar to prostate cancer. And so the United States Task Force, they based their studies or their, their guidelines on a lot of old data that didn't have active surveillance in their studies. Okay, so basically they were saying, okay, we're looking at all these studies and men didn't benefit. But that's really not quite true, okay, because with our later data, we've shown that men are still living a great life, you know, no erectile dysfunction, no urinary incontinence, and they're not dying from their prostate cancer. So that's a great quality of life factor. So it's important to know also the task force is made up of, you know, not that there's anything wrong, I mean, obviously they're wonderful, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, behavioralists, OBGYN and nursing. No urologist, oncologist or radiation oncologist weighed in on anything. So they weren't part of this to be able to say, hey, this is not the data and studies that we did in the 90s. Like, there's new information. We're treating prostate cancer different. And a big thing that we like to say in urology is that we're doing shared decision making. Okay, so that's where we are now, and that's where our guidelines are. Oh, sorry, I should probably say one thing. So what Dr. Bora was talking to you about with breast cancer, they give, you know, screening breast cancer of women 50 to 74 a grade B. So it's like, okay, that, that seems like a pretty good consensus, B, let's, let's do breast cancer screening. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for PSA, they give men 55 to 69 a grade C, and they give men 70 plus a grade D. But just like Dr. Boris said, I have lots of 70-year-old patients, I have a lot of 90-something-year-old patients, okay? So if you're gonna live another 30 years, you're trying to tell me I'm not gonna ask my 70-year-old if he wants a PSA? So that's why, for us, we're a little touchy about the task force because I, I always tell my patients, well, look, I hope you're gonna to live to 100. So if we have to work on another 30 years, of course I'm gonna make sure that you don't have clinically significant prostate cancer that can kill you. So unfortunately, because of the grade C and grade D recommendation, there are some primary cares who don't check PSA. You know, they, they won't do it at all and I have one patient from this person in particular who came in with metastatic prostate cancer when his wife finally made him switch doctors to get someone who would check his PSA. 
So we, as the urologic community, oncologic and radiation oncology community, we don't agree with this screening recommendation. The screening recommendation from the American Urologic Association, so like my bosses, we talk a lot about shared decision making. Because like anything, you know, I, I always like to say, if COVID taught us anything, if you have a belief in your mind, if you pull on that thread and go down the Google hole, you're gonna find people, books, websites that agree with what you want. You know, to the point where there's literally a book called Prostate Snatchers. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and so alternatively, like I had a patient who told his primary care he did not believe in PSA, did not believe in PSA. He got mad when his, his primary care checked his PSA and because he was having hip pain. Turned out he had metastatic prostate cancer. His PSA was 800. And he still was like, well, I don't know if I have prostate cancer. And we're like, okay, you do. So, you know, it's all about shared decision making now. And this, and this is what's important because, you know, because PSA is controversial, any one of you can go home and you, you're going to be able to find plenty of websites that say don't check your PSA. And that's fine. And, you know, I really had tried to have really good conversations with people as to what their life expectancy is, their goals, their treatment decisions. And one of the things that I, you know, before I get to a biopsy, and that's the other issue, because biopsies of prostates are really invasive and can have, you know, risks of sepsis and Bleeding, I mean, it happens in less than 1% of men, but if you're that you know, 0.5 guy and you get septic or you have blood coming out of your rectum, that's concerning. But the biopsy, before we get there, you know, I, really had, I have a really good discussion with my patients to make sure they understand that, okay, look, your PSA is not where it belongs, and there's a chance that I might find prostate cancer that I'm going to tell you to just keep an eye on it. Let's make sure you know, nothing looks wrong. And what is PSA? So PSA is a protein-specific antigen. It's a protein that the prostate produces, and this is where it gets controversial. So there are definitely cancers that if you take the blood number for it, if it's high, you have, you have that cancer, and in particular, say, ovarian cancer. You know, there's certain blood numbers. PSA can be high just for having a prostate, okay? PSA can be high if you're having a, a prostatitis infection. I have men who go in with um, bladder infections to ERs, and for some reason unknown to me, you know, the ER doctors might check their PSA. I mean, I had a gentleman who had his PSA checked when he was having an active infection, and it came back at 25. So of course, he was hysterical, he thought he had prostate cancer, you know, but after treating the infection, his PSA came down to two. Okay, so during active infection, you don't wanna check it because it can be falsely elevated. So that's why it's, it's part of, it kind of gets entwined in this controversy because we're causing a lot of stress for people unnecessarily. But the general recommendations or what the PSA should be is for men in their 40s, it should be less than two and a half, 50s less than three and a half, 60s less than four and a half. So, and often the primary cares just do this on an annual basis. Most of the people around here, there's only one that I know is so anti-PSA. Most of the primary cares around here are really good about checking PSAs. So our shared decision-making model is that you can absolutely start screening any man at the age of 55 and older, or 50 and older, depending on some of the reasons that you're talking to them about it. About it. The people that absolutely need to be checked are anyone with a uh, first degree relative, like Dr. Boro was saying, but in this case, it would be a father or a brother. If you have up two relatives who have prostate cancer, who even if it's a brother and a cousin, then that actually does put you at increased risk. If you're of African American descent, or if we know you have a known germline mutation, which you know we're gonna hear a lot about genetics later, that's also a very strong reason. I have one patient who all three of his uncles had prostate cancer, so absolutely, he and I started checking at 50, okay? But there's some people, you know, I, I have a patient I just diagnosed, he's 53, and he has two boys who are young, and I told them that they need to start getting screened at 40, okay? So it, it's never, it's not perfect, you know? It's all about figuring out each individual situation and whether or not, you know, they want to get started, if they would even do anything. For instance, I have patients who get who are 85, very ill, lots of medications, a lot of heart problems, and that, those primaries check the PSA. 
And that you don't want to do, right? If someone you know is going to die more than likely in the next year or two of a heart attack, yeah, they, they don't need a PSA, okay? I have another gentleman who has a lot of vascular issues. He cannot come off his blood thinners. He just can't. Because if he, the last time he did, he had a stroke. So there's no reason to check the PSA in him because even if it's high, there's nothing I can really do about it, right? So that's why there's a lot of shared decision making and trying to evaluate. And in fact, it, this is kind of morbid, but there are social security calculators where you can put in your, your statistics, like 68, Caucasian, like how many medical pro like medications you're on, and it'll give you a 10 and 20 year estimate of your life expectancy. So that sometimes going, goes into decision making as well. Like, are you going to be around for 10 years? And the reason why we use 10 years as a marker is because prostate cancer is very slow growing, generally speaking. So we want to know, well, if, if, if you're not going to be alive in 10 years, why am I going to put you through the stress of a biopsy and things like that for, for just a number, right? You don't, you don't want to just treat a number. So there are a lot of nuances in trying to figure out who's appropriate for a biopsy and who isn't. And so at the end of the day, now with the PSA and the rectal exam, and again, you know, what we're feeling for on rectal exams is normal prostate feels like this, and prostate cancer feels like a fingernail. Okay, so that's why it's strange to me, but our guidelines don't even say that we have to do a digital rectal exam, but I do do a digital rectal exam. So if any men in here don't like those, you're not gonna come see me because I do torture my men, if, you know. <laughs> but, but the good news is the guidelines now say for low risk, we can t check every two to four years. Whereas I was every year, come on, step right up. Now for my lower risk guys, I am letting them go every two years. Every four years to me seems too much, but you know, now I'm, I'm doing an every two year model with both PSA and the digital rectal exam. Um, and then, you know, as people get older, then we just need to just talk about it, you know, and figure out if we wanna do this. Like a 90 year old man, essentially, like the, our current guidelines are, if you're 90 years old, if your PSA is less than 10, leave it alone. So our guidelines currently say that if a PSA is over 10 at age 90, that's when I have a very lengthy discussion with them, like, okay, like, do you want to do this? Like, we don't have to, okay? I, I joke with my 90-year-olds that I give them suggestions, and they can just tell me what they want to do, because I'm never aggressive with anyone who lived through World War II, you know? I mean, so, um, so it's one of those things that, of course, I was talking about progress, right? So science and scientists, we're always looking for new things. We're looking for more ways to figure this out. You know, before we put someone through a biopsy, what, what else can we do? There are special urine tests, and I think it's really funny, I always talk about special urine tests, that actually look for genetic markers in urine to see if there are prostate cancer mutations, okay? So we have those as elements. Uh, our guidelines say you shouldn't do it right at first as a screening tool. It should always be part of a secondary evaluation. Uh, we have MRIs, right? We have all these great machines. And so the last decade, we've really looked at using MRI to find places that look suspicious. Uh, again, that's still an evolution. It's not perfect. If anyone ever tells you you have prostate cancer based on an MRI, that's flat out wrong, and I can't stand that there are people who do that. And one of the big things that some of you guys might see that primary cares are doing, but they don't fully understand sometimes, is we have a protein called free PSA. So most PSA is floating around in the bloodstream, just on its own, connected to another protein. We found there's something called free PSA when it's not connected to the other protein. If that percentage is low, that has a higher risk of prostate cancer. So it's another blood test, you know, pretty non-invasive. You just have it drawn when you get your PSA drawn. The reason why I say people aren't using it quite right is that it's only valid for PSAs 4 to 10. So I see people all the time with PSAs of 2 getting a free PSA as well, and the test isn't meant for that. So PSAs of 4 to 10, that's a useful tool, but then otherwise it's not. So we're trying. So hopefully, you know, in the future we're going to find better MRI techniques, better genetic markers to try and figure out who's appropriate for a biopsy. But at the end of the day, my suggestion to everyone is, you know, absolutely, particularly healthy people between 50 and 80, absolutely you should be getting your PSA checked.
Maybe that's it. Yeah. Correct. Well, you might have a male loved one in your life. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm going to start off by a quick anecdote that as I was sitting here, my sister texted me about lung cancer. She's asking, is lung cancer becoming more prevalent? I was like, why are you asking? She's like, I just have two patients. She's a pharmacist. I have two patients in their 50s that got diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. Um, and they were non-smokers. And that's part of the discussion that we're not going to be talking about. But I think that's, to me, that's why it's important to discuss this um, today on the Lung Cancer Awareness Month of November. Um, my goals today is we're going to speak, hopefully by the end of the presentation, you're going to be comfortable or thinking about why it's important to pay attention to lung cancer, why do we need to screen, and what does it mean to screen versus getting a diagnostic CAT scan, uh, what does a low-dose CAT scan mean, which is what we're going to talk about, um, how are we doing with lung cancer screening, and maybe touch upon the find the, where lung cancer screening may be going. So lung cancer is the leading cause of death um, of cancers. And it combined prostate, breast, and uh, colorectal cancers do not surpass lung cancer. It is the leading cause of cancer death. Um, and it's the third common, most common cancer in all new cancers that are diagnosed. About 240,000 people will be diagnosed annually in the United States with lung cancer. And this is another schematic kind of looking at the same statement that I made before, that more cancer death occur from lung cancer than the three other ca cancer causes that we think of most commonly, breast, prostate, and colorectal. And even though it only makes up about 13% of new cancers, it contributes 24% of death uh, from cancer. And if you compare it to prostate or breast, lung cancer will kill more men and more women than either prostate or breast. And why is that? Unfortunately, lung cancer can go for quite some time without being detected. And so this is a nice schematic of the lung. Uh, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the windpipe in the middle, and the windpipe splits into two airways that go into the right and left lung. And you see the branches, it keeps branching out until you get to the slow sacs the alveoli or the air sacs where most of the lung function happens. And on the outside, there is a membrane called the pleura. Everything inside that pleura doesn't have any pain receptors. So if you have a small cancer that grows and grows and grows, and somebody may not be very active or you know, they have a dust job, they may not notice the loss in their lung function until they get to a point where they have blood in their sputum or they start getting some pain from the cancer getting big enough that it impacts the chest wall or the pleura. And so this is not a new problem. Uh, NIH in 1970 talked about uh, lung cancer, improved survival uh, through earlier detection uh, is, 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 is one of the big goals. Um, and why is it important to look at early diagnosis, which is kind of the theme of everything that we're talking about, um, why is it important to detect it early? If you look at the stage of the cancer when it gets diagnosed and survival at five years, unfortunately, it correlates with worse survival. So there are two things I want you to walk away from looking at the screen. In yellow and in blue, those are advanced cancers. So the majority of lung cancer diagnosis are happening at an advanced stage, not what we're hoping for. And the majority of those who survive at, fi at the five-year mark are the patients that were in the purple or the pink, which were the early stage cancers. And so if you get diagnosed late, survival is significantly worse. Um, and a big reason for that is it makes Dr. Vora's task much harder because there are so many more cancer cells that have to be eradicated or killed with chemotherapy and radiation, and invariably, some of them will escape. So what do we do about it? Lung cancer screening has been something that has been talked about, studied for a long time. Initially, we looked at chest x-rays. That didn't work out. We looked at sputum. If we look for cancer cells in sputum, that didn't work out. Until in 2011, uh, there was a big study that looked at low-dose CAT scans. And that study showed that there was benefit. 
Um, one of the ways that we measure how good a test does is the number needed to treat or number needed to screen, which effectively looks at how many patients have to get this test for one person to benefit. And for lung cancer, based on a low-dose CAT scan, it's about 1 in 320. Uh, for colon cancer, it's a hun 1 in 817, and for breast, it's about 1 in 1,300 uh, patients. So it has a pretty good number needed to screen, meaning it would force us to push for it and get it. So just so we're all familiar with what we're talking about, what is a CAT scan versus a chest x-ray? On the right here, this is a normal chest x-ray. A CAT scan is a compilation of about maybe sometimes between 250 to 600 images that the, the computer puts together that lets us take a nice look at what the lung looks like, every part of it. And you can see on a chest x-ray, this is one image. On a CAT scan, we get hundreds of images that look like this looking at every piece of the lung. You can see the level of detail that you see on a CAT scan. So it's a very sophisticated way to look at the lung and the airways. Um, one thing that's important to note is when we talk about low-dose CAT scan, we're talking about screening. And I think this applies for most cancer screenings. Screening is only done when somebody is perfectly healthy. If you're going to see the doctor because you have a problem, we're no longer in a screening phase. Now we're in a diagnostic phase. So when we're talking about screening, this patient has no problems, no shortness of breath, no cough or such. And in such, we do a low-dose CAT scan. Why do we do a low-dose CAT scan? Uh, there is radiation. Everything in medicine that we do carries risks and complications. And uh, one of the ways that we make our decisions is we, kind of what Dr. Lou alluded to, is we weigh the risks and benefits to decide what would be the right thing to do. And so for lung cancer screening, perfectly healthy patient, we don't need the full dose gas scan. We can reduce the radiation exposure to that patient so we can get just the amount of detail that we need to have a good discussion about what we're seeing in the CAT scan. And so the dose for, to give you, I'm not a, a physicist, but uh, just the, the, the numbers empirically I think are useful to note. For a regular CAT scan, it's about seven millisieverts. For a low dose CAT scan, it's two. So way less than half, maybe about like 25% of the dose. Um, and if you compare that to how much radiation we're exposed to, just from walking the earth or flying, it's less than what you would annually be exposed to. Uh, it's still significant because you get it in the span of one or two minutes, but in, an, in one year, we get about 3.6 millisieverts exposure, uh, just being alive. So <clears throat> which patients would qualify for lung cancer screening? And this is what Dr. Vora was alluding to. It's on the, <laughs> it's on the screen, I think. Uh, actually, no, it's, it's not updated. Yeah, this, this is Medicare. So Medicare data, Medicare has not kept up with the new guidelines. The new guidelines, 2021, USPTF changed it, and today ACS joined in, in the same recommendation. The initial recommendation was 55 to 77, um, 55 to 80, and Medicare went up to only 77. And as we got more and more experience, the initial data came from 2011. It's 12 years have passed. The age went down. So now it's from 50 to 80. If you're a Medicare participant and you don't have any other supplemental insurance, Medicare will not cover after 77. If you have a commercial plan or supplemental plan, they will go up to 80. Um, and to the same point that was made by Dr. Lu and Dr. Vora, there are patients that we may do it for longer, depending on their, what we think the lifespan is going to be. If somebody is perfectly healthy, doesn't have any other comorbidities, we may go for longer. So um, this is for Medicare 55 to 75, but outside of Medicare 50, to, to 80, and the 30 pack year was the initial guideline, but that has dropped to 20 pack years. The way we measure pack years is if you smoked one pack per day for 10 years, that's one pack times 10, 10 pack years. If you smoked half a pack for 20 years, that's 10 pack years. And so we do that calculation, uh, fairly simple. Um, and if you met the 20 pack years, then you, qualify for the screening as well. And the last aspect is you had you are actively smoking or quit smoking within 15 years. So once somebody quits more than 15 years, their risk, their risk for lung cancer doesn't go back to normal, but it approaches normal. And so in those patients, screening would not be, would not be wise because the chances of false positives go up. So to summarize the three categories that a patient has to meet 
to get a low dose CAT scan is 50 to 80, has smoked 20 pack years, and quit smoking in the past 15 years or actively smoking. Um, and I, I made this point earlier that a low dose CAT scan is not meant for somebody who has symptoms. This is somebody who's perfectly healthy. The only reason they're getting the CAT scan is for, for screening. And so the two, in terms of the objectives that I talked to you about initially, we hopefully we get an idea for why we need to pay attention to lung cancer. It's the top, uh, it's the top killer uh, out of all the cancers. And why do we need to screen? And why do we need to screen for it? And hopefully have an understanding for the screening versus agnostic CAT scan and low dose versus chest X-ray. Um, so how are we doing with low dose CT or lung cancer screening? Unfortunately, not great. So California is has one percent of patients that are eligible are actually getting screened. Nationally, the rate is six percent, and so we're the fifty-first state in terms of lung cancer screening. And part of the reason for it, there is a stigma with lung cancer screening because the thought that somebody may have brought onto themselves, or that you know I'm still smoking, I don't feel comfortable getting a CAT scan or I'm gonna be judged for getting a CAT scan because I'm a smoker, given that the biggest risk factor for lung cancer is, is smoking, which doesn't happen with a lot of other diseases. So for cardiovascular disease, a lot of it is driven by diet and lifestyle, um, and we don't have that same stigma. So that's a lot of what we spend our time talking about is discussing with patients uh, the importance of getting the screening. The other aspect to it, which goes back to the shared decision making that was discussed earlier, is anytime we get a CAT scan, there is a chance we find something that's not cancer, but is not normal. And what do we do with that? There is a psychological aspect to it, getting a little concerned and anxious about the findings, and there may be procedures that have to happen. And so it's always good to discuss beforehand those things and taking into consideration the overall health of the patient. So if somebody is very ill from other issues or too frail to undergo any therapy for lung cancer, lung cancer screening may not be for them. But if somebody is perfectly healthy, has a good life expectancy, after reviewing the pros and cons, then that would be the patient to, to pursue. Um, the false positive rate, meaning that we find something on CAT scan that doesn't correlate with cancer, initially was at 27% in 2011. And through multiple iterations of the guidelines and refining what we look at the CAT scan and what crosses the threshold for us to call concerning and making the radiological reads uniform, it has dropped down somewhere between 10 to 15%. So not insignificant, uh, but not as high as it used to be. We talked about the stigma from uh, lung cancer screening. One aspect to this and to the, my earlier anecdotes, the two patients that my sister happened to text me about today are both non-smokers. Um, and this is something that we don't have a good understanding for. Lung cancer seems to be going up in non-smokers and going up in females. And it's unclear what's driving this, uh, but majority of cancer, still lung cancer happens in smokers, about 85 to 90%. So hopefully with this, if you have the history or you know of somebody that has that history, I would encourage them strongly to think about the importance of lung cancer screening and having that discussion with their physician. Right. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody for sticking with us and uh, waiting for the last one. So I'm gonna be talking about how our genes and how our genetics impact our risks for cancer. Let's see, hold on, okay. Um, so, an interesting thing about cancer is that really all cancer has a genetic component to it, meaning that cancer is associated with small changes in our genes that build up over time. And all those accumulation of changes in our genes eventually impact how our cells can function, how they grow, how they regulate each other. And when our cells get to a point that they can't regulate itself, that's when they can start growing out of control and leading to cancer. But there's only a small percentage of cancer, only about 10%, five to 10%, that has what we call a hereditary basis. And what that means is that these individuals are born with something inside of their cells 
that they inherited from a parent, either their mother or their father, that puts them at a higher chance that they can develop certain types of cancers over their lifetime. And our hope is to be able to differentiate who falls into that hereditary category because we may want to screen those individuals a little bit different than that general population category than what Dr. Liu and Dr. Vora had been talking about. So if we know that somebody has a higher chance to get a cancer, maybe we can start those screenings earlier, maybe we can do more frequent screenings, different types of screenings to again be able to catch those cancers early maybe prevent those cancers from happening in the first place, and changing the trajectory of how that cancer can impact that individual's life. So most cancers about, oops, hold on. Most cancers are about 75 to 85% of cancers are due to sporadic causes, meaning that age is a big uh, risk factor for cancer. We know as we age, as our bodies get exposed to more and more things in the environment, the chances that we can develop cancer increases. And that's why with those screening tools, they don't start when people are in their 20s or their 30s. They start when you're in your 60s, 50s, uh, a little bit later on in life. Um, lifestyle fa can factor in, uh, body uh, weight and obesity can factor in, as Dr. Vora had discussed, um, gynecologic history, and um, a lot of it is actually unknown. These are random processes that are happening in our bodies and lead to those cancers developing. And then there is another portion of cancer, about 10 to 15% of cancer we call having a familial basis. And those cancers happen not necessarily because of a predominant genetic mutation that someone has that leads to them developing their cancers. Instead, it's due to a shared environment as well as smaller genetic components that are shared within a family. So if we think about a family all growing up on a farm and a bunch of those siblings developed a cancer related to each other, maybe it was because of the exposures on a farm as well as their smaller genetic components that they share among siblings that can lead to that developing. So a little bit of the background, and this is going to play into um, more in terms of these hereditary cancers in a little bit, um, is to help having an understanding about what makes something genetic, what makes a cancer genetic. And to do that, we kind of have to trace that back, think back, put your kind of high school biology or college biology hats on, and think back to uh, what our cells are. So our bodies are made up of these tiny microscopic structures called cells. Inside of our cells, we have these other structures called chromosomes. And our chromosomes are made up of those tightly packed uh, forms of instruction in, in DNA. And so if we unravel those chromosomes, all of those are kind of step-by-step -step instructions to make a protein in our body. And all of the thousands of proteins in our bodies work together, operate together. That's really how our bodies can function, is with the help of these uh, proteins right here. So we can kind of think of every gene in our uh, chromosomes as like a recipe. It's a very specific step-by-step -step instruction to make a protein. And if I think about that recipe analogy, as I'm copying down, let's say I'm copying down my mom's famous cake recipe from her, cake, her cookbook, and I'm writing it down so quickly that I forget to write down the sugar. If I'm not having my thinking cap on and I'm following that recipe step by step by step, and I pull that cake out of the oven at the end and I try a slice, that cake is gonna taste pretty terrible because I forgot a really important ingredient in that recipe. And that's exactly how our genes work. These are very specific step-by-step -step recipes to make a protein. And if there is a misspelling or if there is an important part of a gene that's missing, that's called a mutation. And when there's a mutation within the gene, then the protein that it's trying to make doesn't get made properly. It can't do the job that it's supposed to do properly within the body. So what does this all have to do with cancer? So again, when we think about our genes, we know everybody gets two copies of a gene. You get one copy of a gene from your mother, and you get a corresponding copy of the same gene from your father. And if somebody has their own children, you separate those genes up into either separate egg cells or separate sperm cells. Anytime you have a child, it's a flip of the coin chance which gene gets passed on to your child. So you don donate one of your genes, your partner donates one of his or her genes, and combined, you 
uh, provide all of that genetic information for your children. Now, in cancer, we have a very important group of genes inside of our cells, and those genes are called tumor suppressor genes. Again, everybody is born with two copies of their tumor suppressor genes. You get one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad. And most people don't carry genetic mutations within these genes. And so what happens is they make, their bodies and their cells make proteins that we call tumor suppressor proteins. And those kind of act like breaks inside of our cells that can regulate those cells, protect those cells from growing out of control, and in a sense, prevent those cells from growing into cancer. So if we think about our bodies as like a cancer uh, cell system, hopefully all of our cells have two functional breaks inside of them. And that's regulating those cells, that's making sure that they're doing what they need to do. But as we live longer, as we get exposed to more and more things in the environment and just natural wear and tear that's happening in our cells, potentially one of those genes, one of those breaks can build up with enough accumulation of these environmental mutations to knock it out. But that's okay because those cells still have one functional break inside of those cells and that's able to regulate those cells. They're not growing out of control. They're not growing into cancer. Over time, though, as your bodies get exposed to more and more things in the environment, just natural wear and tear that's happening, maybe that second break can get knocked out. Once you have both of those breaks knocked out, that's when those cells have the ability to start growing out of control. That's when the ability to start growing into cancer happens. And so if somebody's born with two working breaks, it takes a long time for that to happen. And that's why we usually see cancers happening when people are older, when they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s. What happens in these hereditary forms of cancers is that instead of being born with those two working breaks, one copy of that break, and it can either come from mom or it can come from dad, but one copy of that break already has a mutation, already has that spelling mistake that's knocked it out already. And so all of the cars in your cells or all of the cells in your body are driving around with one working break. And that's okay because that one working break can do what it needs to do. But if it gets knocked out, now we can see cancers and sometimes those cancers can lead to different kinds of patterns. Um, and so that's just the analogy here. We are kind of growing it into a, a way where we get knocked out, those, those genes get knocked out, and eventually those cancers can occur. So what are some of the patterns that can be uh, indicative of a hereditary or an, uh, a, pr a genetic predisposition? One of the things that we're looking at is how old were people when they were diagnosed with their cancers? If we see family members, or if you yourself had been diagnosed with a cancer happening at a younger age than we would typically expect to see, that can sometimes be an inherited reason for why you may have developed that cancer. So if a woman is diagnosed with a breast cancer when she's in her 30s or 40s, that's younger than we typically expect to see breast cancers happening when women are in their 60s or their 70s. And so that can be a reason to talk with your physicians, talk to your care team about maybe considering some genetic testing at that point in time. Another thing that we think about is, again, if all of our cells in our bodies are missing that one copy of a gene, that one break, then we may see some more unusual or uncommon types of cancers within a family or within an individual. So things like a man diagnosed with a breast cancer, a woman with an ovarian cancer, somebody with a pancreatic cancer or brain cancers, those cancers don't happen very often. And so if they pop up within a family, then again, that could be a reason to explore potential genetic testing and uh, providing that information. And then lastly, again, because our genes come from our parents, we know that a lot of times these patterns will start tracking along a family line. And so it can be helpful to ask relatives, ask uh, uh, parents, aunts, uncles, other distant cousins about their family history. Because if we start to see those patterns tracking um, along a bloodline, if we see earlier cancers, unusual cancers, all on one side of the family, that could potentially be a reason to explore these genetic 
causes for cancers. And if we have these inherited causes for cancers, again, we can be more proactive about somebody's screening. Instead of waiting until a woman is 40 when she starts her mammograms, if a woman has a genetic predisposition, we want to start those screenings early when she's 25 and sometimes in certain cases instead of when she's 40. Or we might want to start doing different kinds of screenings compared to the general population. So this is a very uh, nuanced tool. Um, and again, this is a very detailed, um, detailed chart, but some of those kind of big keys are think about, about how old people were in your family when they were diagnosed, what types of cancers. Um, if there are multiple cancers within your family, that could be a reason to ask your doctor about genetic testing and what that can provide. Um, and so what, I'm a genetic counselor, I'm not a physician. And so what exactly are we? We are part of that shared uh, discussion among the physician and your physician team. So we can kind of go into this process in any form of your uh, process in terms of uh, cancer screenings and family history. Some physicians will order genetic testing like the BRCA testing for patients first and wait until they get the results. And then they may refer a patient to a genetic counselor to discuss what those results mean, how we can best screen individuals, how we can best follow individuals. Sometimes physicians will refer a patient uh, before the genetic testing to really go over the nuts and bolts about what that genetic testing is. Genetic counselors can help explain insurance coverage and other things that individuals may want to consider before moving forward with genetic testing. One of the big ones is, um, is there any potential form of discrimination that can happen? If I'm healthy, if I don't have a cancer myself, can I be discriminated against if I have these genetic predispositions? And so this is what genetic counselors can talk about is all the ins and outs about, you know, doing genetic testing and then bringing that in with their physician so that everybody can make those shared decisions moving forward. Um, and I didn't go over any specific types of cancers just because it was going to get into the nitty gritty and I was uh, short on time. But if you have any specific questions, I think now is a potential time to ask those questions out of all of us. So here are my little ones adding to Dr. Vora's. <laughs> so well. Right now, this is a question and answer. I think there was a lot of great information yeah. presented and really kind of got some things going. I know it was a good question myself. So um, please, um, I'll tell you what, we, uh, we have uh, guests who are on Zoom. I'm going to go to you first. So I'll bring the microphone over to you just so they can hear the question. My question, really simple. Um, so my husband was diagnosed with colon cancer at 48, and he passed away at 53. I have a son who's turning 25, and I feel compelled to get, even out of pocket, colonoscopy. So is that too early? I mean, should I? Is it? Well, so there are a few different components. One is, again, we're kind of trying to decide, does someone fall into that hereditary category, or may somebody fall into that familial category when they have a family history, but they don't carry a genetic mutation? We kind of want to follow those individuals a little bit differently. So the first step might be uh, for your son to talk with his doctors about potentially doing genetic testing um, so that he can see if he has an inherited form of cancer. If he does, the screening is going to be based on what that gene is and what the risks are. So Dr. Vora had talked about something called Lynch syndrome, where we can see colon cancers at younger individuals. We follow those people very specifically, and we have guidelines about that. If your son do, does genetic testing and tests negative, then we know he's not necessarily in that inherited category, he's in that familial category. And guidelines at that point say to start colon screening 10 years before the earliest diagnosis or at eight, oh, yeah, or I, now all of a sudden they changed the guidelines on me. Dr. Vora might be able to answer that. I think it's either uh, 10 years before the earliest diagnosis or age 40, whichever one comes first. So that would be um, like 33. 33. In his case. Yeah. Okay. But I would say have that discussion with his physician about maybe doing genetic testing. Okay. Yeah. And the cost of genetic testing used to be very expensive. A lot of people in the late 1990s, early 2000s had large out of pocket costs for genetic testing. Insurance didn't always cover genetic testing. 
Things are very different now. The right. cost for genetic testing has gotten much more affordable and insurances are covering it because they realize the utility of that. And your office, your office at Memorial does that? I mean, we have, do, we cards. do. Okay. Um, so you can come and talk to me afterwards okay. and All I'll right. explain Thank that. All right, you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a DES daughter, so I started intense uh, uh, every six months when I was a teenager. They were testing me every six months, and at that time, I think it was called a colposcope. Um, they would bring in 15 doctors to all look at it. It was, I guess, a big deal back then, and. I was told in my 40, I believe in my 40s, that once you pass menopause and your estrogen and everything starts to decline, that you don't need to worry about the DES any longer, that you've passed the age in which it's a worry that you could get cancer from it. Is that true? Um, or like, because I, I went to once a year, it used to be every six months, but I've gone to once a year or a year and a half because he said, oh, you don't have to worry about it after you pass menopause. That it's not, I guess the DES declines or something? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. That's a good question that I don't know that I can answer in terms of the risk of developing cancer because of the exposure that, uh, that you had in utero, I guess is, is really what you're saying. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I think we should, I don't even know who I would go to to, to answer that question, but I think it's a good one. And so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look that up and I'll try and get an answer to you if I can. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from one of our guests. Uh, Dr. Youssef, one of our guests grew up in the 1950s in heavy San Gabriel Valley smog. What is the lung cancer risk factor? And how about in combination with secondhand smoke from a smoking parent? <laughs> so again, that, that, that's another tough question. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just talking with Dr. Vora after the talk. A lot of those lung cancer cases that we're not sure in non-smokers whether they're coming up, <clears throat> we don't have a good idea. But potentially exposure to there's some thought about exposure to biofuel uh, if you were indoor cooking, uh, exposure to pollution. And so that question about air quality index, um, there is currently no guidelines about, we do know that exposure to certain elements increases your risk for lung cancer. So if you're exposed to asbestos or, or in a high area that has radon, um, your risk for lung cancer goes up. That's not incorporated in the guidelines. We don't know how much the risk goes up by. And so those patients, this is a blind spot. We know we don't know about those patients. And so in terms of advising about lung cancer screening for those patients, it becomes a little bit dicey because if you screen somebody that has a low pretest probability, meaning we don't, if their risk is not what the average moderate to high risk that we're screening for, the test is not validated for it and you may end up with a much higher false positive rate. And so you may end up causing yourself a lot of anxiety and worry without getting a lot of the benefit. Um, secondhand smoking is recognized as one of the other causes that, that increases the risk for lung cancer, but it's difficult to quantify. Um, and so I would go back to if somebody's having s symptoms, mm -hmm. then we go out of the screening phase. It becomes irrelevant. We go into a diagnostic phase where we figure out why they're having the symptoms and do the appropriate workup. But in terms of somebody who's perfectly healthy, there is currently no evidence to suggest they should be screened. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have one other question. Uh, Dr. Liu, what are some of the newer prostate cancer treatments besides removal and radiation? Um, this guest has read that there are newer, less invasive, invasive treatments now available, such as radio ligand, and also, that will also avoid some of the ED urinary side effects. So that's a really kind of a loaded question. Again, prostate cancer is just very tough. <laughs> no, but there are absolutely newer methods for treatment of prostate cancer, but it's really based on the grade, like how I was telling you, like, is it a low grade, like non-aggressive one, or is it a high grade aggressive one? Uh, and so absolutely, there's surgery, there's radiation, and the important thing to know, and I don't know this, but the important thing to know about radiation is that there are different kinds of radiation, and the radiation that they offer now is 
much better and much more directed than the radiation, say, 10, 20 years ago. So there are a lot of different ways that we've been able to improve radiation treatment now versus 20 years ago, and that includes for women as well, you know, for cervical cancers and things like that. And then there are, there's a whole branch of minimally invasive, more targeted treatments for prostate cancer. Uh, one of the ones that, you know, some people are doing is something called HIFU. It's a uh, high intensity focused ultrasound, basically. In this country, it is only approved for prostate ablation. It is not approved for prostate cancer treatment. So there are urologists and radiation oncologists and radiologists even who are doing it in this country, but technically it's not approved for prostate cancer, okay? And so that's why the people who are doing it are paying three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 out of pocket for it. I mean, there were even some people who were flying to Mexico to pay $10,000 for it because it's much more um, focused, so you don't have to worry as much about ED. There are a lot of universities in the United States right now that are doing clinical trials to see if they can prove it, but it's a very old procedure that actually has been used extensively in Europe and Canada and Australia, and Europe still loves HIFU. Canada and Australia have actually essentially said no more. There's only one center in each country that allows for it for patients who really want that rather than flying them to Europe. Uh, so personally, I don't recommend HIFU. I've seen it really abused. It's been used in you know, men with high-risk prostate cancer that it was obviously going to fail. And you know, like what I told one of my patients who asked me about it, I said, look, you know, quite honestly, technique-wise, HIFU is really not difficult. If I wanted to, I could certainly learn how to do it and ask $6,000 cash from patients, but I won't because I think there's an ethical issue there if it's not really meant to treat prostate cancer. So HIFU, if you're doing it, you, you know, UCLA does have a, a trial right now. Uh, there's another one, like a aqua ablation. Again, not approved for prostate cancer. It is approved for prostate ablation, so it's approved for you know the guys who just have the enlarged prostate and aren't urinating well. But again, you're having you know, for as much as people want to make fun of Medicare, Medicare is a a, a very thoughtful health insurance. Okay, and all other health insurances base their decisions on what Medicare covers. So I think a very easy way to know if something is, I wouldn't say everything that Medicare doesn't cover is a sham, but a lot of it is a sham, okay? If Medicare's not covering it, there's pretty much a reason because they really do try to make good decisions for outcomes for patients. So unless, uh, my belief is if you're doing something that's not one of the standard treatments, you really should be doing it at a university center in a clinical trial. And if it's just some guy who's promising you in Florida that he's, not, he's gonna treat your prostate cancer, no, this is a true story. I had a patient who, flew, who lives in Hawaii, flew to Florida for this treatment, couldn't pee afterwards, and then came to see me in LA. Like, it was it's just crazy. Because again, there's so much online about prostate cancer. And uh, it, it's, you, if you get in this little, you know, silo of information, you believe everything that keeps coming at you from it. So this guy from Hawaii flew to Florida for a treatment and couldn't pee afterwards, came to see me, and then when, I, when it turned out it really didn't even treat his prostate cancer, he, he kind of had a mind melt. Well, you know, like it was really sad for me to tell him that, look, hey, you know, when I saw him in follow-up, like your PSA is not down, like your prostate cancer is not going anywhere. It really, it, it, it hurts him, and I, and I understand why. I mean, he's paid, spent like five or $6,000 out of pocket for it. So bottom line, talk to your doctors, Anything that's promising you, you something is more than likely snake oil. <laughs> How about some other questions from our, yes. Ma'am, if you want to just stand up. I have a couple of questions. Um, screening, is there too much? I get mammogram once a year. I also get an MRI once a year. My daughter tells me I'm getting too much radiation. I need to really calm down because I'm going to be fine. That's question number, number one. Number two, mother and sister, Breast cancer, sister fine, mother passed. Our daughters should go by the age of, my sister was 40, so should they get their first mammogram at 30? That's question number two. Um, question number three, in regards to genetic testing, I've gotten genetic testing, my sister got genetic testing, it was, everything was pretty much negative. I, we have familial cancers on both sides, my mom and my father. Um, 
what are the psychological effects of knowing that you do have a mutation? And if even because I don't have, didn't have any mutations, that doesn't mean I'm not going to get cancer. So what are the psychological effects? And is that talked about in, in your counseling? Um, and then if you are BRCA1 BRAC or, or BRCA2 positive, you know, what are the downsides of having all of this information as, a, as just a regular patient? Guys, this is a lot, but we have yeah. Lines, we have <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, no, 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 these are great. Um, I will quickly answer question one, and then I'll turn it over to Karen for all the other questions. Um, too much, too. What are the harmful effects of screening too much? So know that MRIs don't have radiation, right? That's magnetic technology. Um, so I'm not so worried about the cumulative effect of MRIs plus mammograms. And I think in some women, when they get their screening mammogram it is recommended to do an MRI because it's hard to really identify what's, what's happening in the breast on a mammogram. So I'm not worried. I think the only thing I'd worry about is that, you know, are, you, are, are we using too many resources? Are we, are we spending too much money by doing mammograms and MRIs if it's not indicated? So I think that's the quick answer to, to your, your specific question. Karen's got the rest. Um, I'm going to try and answer most of these questions, and then maybe we can chat afterwards. Um, first off, um, and I didn't go into too much detail about this, but it's a helpful idea to think about if you've had family members or if you yourself have done genetic testing, when did you do that genetic testing? Because genetic testing has changed over time. Um, in the past, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we really only had the abilities to test for one gene at a time. It was very expensive. Insurance didn't always cover it. And so a lot of times, if you had testing, kinda, and I'm choosing a, a random number, but if you had testing before 2015, it's possible that you only had BRCA testing. You only had testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2. Since about 2013, 2012, 2013, our genetic testing technology has really skyrocketed. We now have the ability to test for a lot of other genes on top of the BRCA genes. And so that's kind of your um, kind of litmus test. If you had it before 2015, go back and check. See, if you had it after, also go back and check. If you had it ordered by uh, a primary care doctor, sometimes those primary care doctors may have only tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2, not necessarily all the other genes that we can now test for. Um, so, so depending on how extensively your family was tested, then it will impact what age we say we recommend family members uh, undergo screenings. Again, the general rule of thumb is if you have first and second degree relatives who've had a breast cancer, start 10 years before the earliest diagnosis or at age 40, whichever one comes first. But again, definitely that discussion with your physician and your treatment team is gonna be helpful. Um, and, and in terms of the psychological aspects of genetics and genetic testing, yes, we. this is what our training as in genetic counseling is all about because genes carry a lot of weight. We, it's a family matter, right? Your genes are not your own. They're shared among other family members. And so if you do genetic testing and you test positive for something, or if you do genetic testing and you test negative for something, that not only impacts you, it also impacts your family members. And so we do get into a discussion about how this impacts your family. And sometimes people decide that they're not comfortable moving forward with genetic testing, given all of those nuts and bolts about things. Um, and so that does play a role. Um, and I think you had one other question. Now I don't remember what it was. But I think okay. I got one over here. Perfect. Sir? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, regarding colon cancer, uh, could a CT scan show, uh, show that, that you had colon cancer, a complete body CT scan? So, yeah. So instead of having to do the invasive colonoscopy, would so, it show up? So a great question. And I get this question quite a bit. Okay. Um, the answer is no, in, a, in very simple terms. Um, the, the colon is a, is a hollow organ, and so CT scans really fail to see the inside of a hollow organ. Okay. CT scans are great for the liver, for example, which is a solid organ, and we can see abnormalities on, in the liver on a CT scan. But the inside of the colon, especially when we're talking about small polyps that are hard to see on scans, can only really be seen visually with a, a colonoscopy. My other question is, uh, in the presentation, in the first part of your presentation up on the screen there, uh, I saw where radiation can cause uh, cancer. Can you explain that? Yeah, so remember that we use radiation, as Dr. Liu was mentioning, and, and 
and others have talked about to treat cancer, right? And the mechanism in which it treats cancer is it targets cells that are dividing quickly and it stops them from dividing. That's sort of the mechanism we're talking about. Well, there are normal cells that are in the radiation field. And so those normal cells, for example, the breast, right? If we were treating lung cancer, for example, or lymphoma like they used to do back in the day, um, the breast is exposed to that radiation. And so the changes in their own DNA from radiation can be that mutation that leads to the next mutation that leads to cancer down the line. So that's sort of the mechanism we're talking about. Good Thank question. You. Sir. Thanks. <clears throat> so I, uh, with genetic uh, testing, let's move on to the tumors. And my question is really for the for the physicians in terms of where you stand on sequencing the tumors of the cancers that you treat. Um, and since the FDA has changed most of the mechanisms from tumor specific to mutation specific for allowing drugs sort of off label and expanding, um, where are we at today with sort of the, like is every tumor sequenced or is it, or is it still tumor specific and saying we're gonna sequence lung and colon because there's more treatments or are we testing everything? Yeah, uh, this, is, this is a perfect question for an oncologist to answer. Um, it, it, and, and the answer is, you know, it, we have made such amazing strides in the last four to five years um, in the oncology world because of sequencing these tumors. So what Stephen is talking about, for, to, to clarify more, is the idea that we take a tumor and we know that this tumor has acquired some sort of power, um, in, in, in simple words, to be able to grow and divide and grow and divide. And so the question is, what about that tumor has allowed for that to happen? And so what we try and do now, and, and my personal practice is really to send a, a next generation sequencing test, so a DNA sequencing test on every tumor. It doesn't mean that I'm going to find the mutation, because our, our technology may not be there yet, but I can test for 648 genes you know, using a, a, a platform. And if one of those genes is mutated, and that was the reason why the tumor is growing, and I have a targeted form of therapy, then I'm much more effective in being able to treat that patient because I'm targeting that mutation. So a great example for that is lung cancer, um, as you were mentioning. Lung cancer is one of these diseases where now, by sequencing these tumors and finding a mutation, we can target it, not using any chemotherapy whatsoever, but using a targeted form of therapy. So. So, you know, a really long answer to your question. The answer is yes. I think everybody should have sequencing done. And I think there are platforms that will do it and not hold the patient accountable to large copays or things like that. And so I think that's up and coming in, in this world. So that's not standard across the country. Do you think that's how far away are we from that? It's, yeah, it's, it's going to get there. It's, it's really going to get there. I mean, it's, it, the treatments are unbelievably... Um, personalized as a result of this. So it's going to get there. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a question regarding lung cancer screening. Um, j just to be clear, because I'm somebody who likes to get their annual screenings done. So for someone who doesn't have a history, hasn't smoked, it's not a screening that you would just do because you want to rule it out, that you would have to have symptoms or be a smoker or have family member that died from lung cancer. Just to, can you just clarify that it's not something you just do routinely like a mammogram every year? You're correct. So even family history is not a reason to undergo lung cancer screening. The three main criteria are age 50 to 80, smoke, the smoking history of 20 packs per year, meaning one pack a day or two packs for 10 years or so on and so forth, and active smoking within the past 15 years. So even smokers that, you know, if, if they lost smoke 20 years ago, they fall out of the criteria because you get into the issue where the false positive rate goes up and the benefits and risks become mismatched. What about asthma? <clears throat> no, it does not as well. Yeah. We've got a question from um, our uh, virtual guests. Someone asked about, uh, they have had a hysterectomy for cervical cancer and wants to know, is it necessary to continue pap screening? And if so, until what age? Yeah, so definitely a question that a gynecologist would be able to answer um, better than me, but I will, or better than I, but I will say that certain hysterectomies preserve the cervix, 
right? And so if the cervix is preserved, then screening should continue. Um, if the cervix has been removed during that hysterectomy, uh, then the thoughts are that that normal PAPs and, and screening tests don't don't need to be done anymore. Okay. But I would encourage that person to definitely discuss their situation with uh, with their gynecologist. Okay, great. Also, building on uh, lung cancer screening, we talked about it with tobacco. What about marijuana? Uh, Do the screening yeah. guidelines apply? Or yeah. we'll that, that, that's a great question. You know, tobacco. Um, marijuana, vaping, uh, the evidence so far is agnostic towards marijuana and vaping. We don't have any data to support lung cancer screening. And, you know, going to Dr. Lou's comment about finding a rabbit hole and getting down there, you can find evidence that uh, marijuana smoking is not associated with lung cancer, and you can find evidence that it is associated with lung cancer. And it, there is probably a lot of variability in terms of how it's inhaled and, and what goes into it that factors into this. Um, so there is no guidance to screen based on marijuana smoking. Um, I would say that in general, anything that shouldn't be in your lungs that you take in, your lung is gonna have to work hard to eliminate it, which increases the chances for cancer. So I would be on the side that it would be advisable to avoid the smoking aspect. Okay. Because it's kind of hard to find marijuana in packs and do those sort of calculations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those gummies, yeah. I think we had a, oh, oh, sorry. So, for years, in the mail, you get these um, life screening um, offers. I mean, I, I think I've gotten them for the last 10, 15 years. And I think it's like 125, it's probably, and they come, and it, it whatever. Number one, are those at all useful or effective? And number two, then someone was telling me there's also something out there that is a little little heftier it, it, it's like 800 bucks and it's sort of the same same concept some full body just to detect i'm sure not to a the degree that going for real real um screenings would be but you know we, we i've seen these for years yeah. and you just go why not or, or not lots of knots okay, okay. All right. lots of knots and i and i that's why yeah. i told them i would take this Yeah, yeah. The most important thing is to see your primary care every year. I mean, honestly, just like what we were talking about screening, it's about prevention. You know, finding a good, the right doctor is like finding the right mate. Sometimes you might have to date around. Like if you're not crazy about your primary care, go find another one. There are a lot of great primary cares around here. And if something's off, then they'll send you to the right specialist and they'll send you, you know, and that's where the screening and all these things come in, okay? And truly there are some great doctors in this area. The reason why we say no, which is actually very similar to why there's controversy over the PSA, right? I told you the example that men's PSA can be elevated if they have a bladder infection and they automatically assume they have cancer. A lot of those screening, because I've seen a lot of these, because I'm actually very manic about looking at images myself. So I have patients who come in who said, my husband bought me a whole body scan for Christmas and they found something on my kidney. I'm like, okay, well, get me the CD because the medical industry is keeping the compact disc industry alive. And I look at them, and honestly, the imaging is so, not all, because I mean, some of them have been pretty good, decent quality. Some of these scans, the quality is just poor. You literally cannot make a good diagnosis off this imaging. And you know, he was showing you pictures of a CT scan versus a chest X-ray. I've seen some of these body scans that look like they're an ultrasound, okay? And the way I like to describe ultrasounds, Ultrasounds are like looking at your menu without your readers on. A CT scan is putting your readers on, okay? So these whole body scans should be CT scans, very clear, very definitive, and they're often not, number one. Number two, never underestimate a good radiologist, okay? I, there are, that's all I'm gonna say. There, there are some good, really good radiologists and there are some really bad radiologists. I mean, I've seen some studies from some imaging centers that are accredited, not even like these, you know, buy one, get, you know, get one things. There are some places in the area that if I get an imaging study from there, I make the patient repeat it because I know it's garbage. Either the technique was bad or the radiologist isn't one that I trust. So when you're doing those, you're gonna get, when we've been talking about false positives. So when you buy these scans or get the carotid artery thing and all that, 
you might get these readings that, oh, you have something on your kidney. Oh, you have something on your heart. And oh, there's a pancreatic cyst. And when you have no one there to talk to you about what that means, you sit for a month trying to get in to see the specialist. You might sit for two months right now to try to get in to see the gastroenterologist to explain what this is on the pancreas. And during that time, you're going to spiral out, convinced you have pancreatic cancer and you have six months to live, right? And then you're going to finally get in to see the gastroenterologist. They're going to say, you know, I don't know if you really have a cyst on your pancreas. Let's repeat it. And it turns out it was just a, a duct that was dilated, okay? So... No, no, no is the recommendation from, you know, medical, the medical community, because if you want that scan, you know, you, a good primary care is either going to talk you off the cliff that you don't need it, or they're going to see something in your blood work that's changed over the years, right? Because it's all about how things are changing. So they always check your liver enzymes. What if one year your liver enzymes do go up? right? So that's why the most important thing you guys can do is just see your primary cares yearly at the very least. So that's a great tee up because on Saturday at Long yes. Beach Memorial, yeah. you all have a flyer here, but it is a big event that's going to be going on specific to um, screening and overall wellness. And I think your participation here tonight demonstrates that you're interested and really engaged in the healthy living and making the most out of your life. And so if you are able to attend on Saturday, please do so. Also, our speakers will be here a bit afterwards, but more importantly, on their bio sheets is their contact information for their offices. And so if you have additional questions and or want to meet with one of them, please do, and especially with the genetics testing. But with that, let's all give our presenters, because you guys gave great information tonight. I, I think we all really benefited from it and appreciate that it wasn't too technical, but darn it, it also engaged us. So thank you very much.